And if I can put a robot in to do what a man can do, and it'll give me the same quality levels and whatnot, what I saw was dramatic enough that I could see almost nobody being needed inside of a factory. I would say that Tesla is at least five or six years ahead of everybody. When I talk about software, it isn't just, just self-driving. That's one aspect. But if you look at everything else that they've got going, Tesla is miles ahead of everyone else. And I have no idea how other people are going to catch up. So we have Sandy Monroe joining us today. Sandy is not just an auto industry expert, but he is widely considered as a teardown titan, a legend in the industry. He and his team members have torn down over 100 cars and are best able to compare the different automakers with each other. Just a month ago, Sandy was given a private tour of Tesla's Gigafactory in Texas. He was able to not only interview five of the top executives in Tesla, but also Elon Musk himself. So who better to ask what makes Tesla years ahead of other automakers? What parts of the production line for the Cybertruck will be shared with the next generation compact car. What does he expect for the RoboTaxi first design vehicle and how might humanoid bots transform the factory? Monroe & Associates is a leading engineering consulting firm known for expertise in reverse engineering, costing and teardown benchmarking. Their team has a rich history in the automotive industry, collaborating with various OEMs and Tier 1 and Tier 2 suppliers. They also have experience in commercial and general aviation within the aircraft industry, and their defense team works with the military in the aerospace, defense, and nuclear industries. Welcome, Sandy. Thank you. I appreciate you joining me. Well, thank you. Thank you, Herbert. I, I'm very, very happy to be here. Very happy. I appreciate you very much, like we said. So you had, you know, exclusive access to Gigafactory Texas. You met with the engineers, top five executives, like I said. And mm -hmm. so from from your understanding of, of what Tesla is doing now, the latest and greatest of what they're doing with Cybertruck, how does that compare um, in terms of what you see the other players in the OEM industries are doing? What separates Tesla? Okay, so let's start with the, the thing that really separates Tesla, and that would be leadership. Um, I don't see uh, the, the next closest person that I would see as far as being a leader would be um, Jim Farley at Ford. <clears throat> the rest of them, um, they flip flop an awful lot. They don't they don't really lead. They kind of listen to what uh, whatever the latest rumor is on on how to produce cars or or worse yet, um, what cars are going to be looking like in, in in the near and even distant future. So that's that's where we have to start right there. And then after that, there's a whole bunch of manufacturing things. And so let's start off with software, because that's kind of like where people like to start. Um, I would say that Tesla is at least five or six years ahead of everybody in software. Nobody has anything quite like it. And uh, when I talk about software, it isn't just um, uh, just self-driving that that's one aspect. But if you look at everything else that they've got going, Tesla is miles ahead of everyone else. And I have no idea how other people are going to catch up. Secondly, um, that's kind of peripheral or whatever, but that's infrastructure. <clears throat> so I just, uh, we have a lightning here. Um, uh, it's our company truck. And, um, and the biggest and best news I ever heard was, was uh, Jim Farley and Elon Musk talking about how they've decided that they'll allow uh, Ford to utilize the uh, Tesla charging system. My guys are hopping up and down on one foot. They're excited as anything because quite frankly, unless you can find an ABB charger, a, you're going to get nothing but heartache and grief. So that's kind of where, um, where I see two of the biggest, the, the biggest change points are the uh, uh, the leadership, the software, and the charging. So those things are common to everybody. And in time, we're going to see everyone be excited about that. No, probably after the election. When Anyhow, uh, let's talk about some of the other stuff. So uh, big for me was when I find, when I went to, and when I heard about 48 volts. <clears throat> so I've been um, trying to convince people that 48 volts or 42 volts is the right way to go for 40 years, literally 40 years. That's how long we've been trying to move away from 12 volts to 48 volts. And the reason for that is number one, weight, number two, cost. 
whenever you start looking at 12 versus 48, I'm looking at a quarter of the diameter for the wires, a quarter of the cost for the wires, um, infinitely more room for putting harnesses in place. This was a brilliant genius move and it enabled other things. So the ether ring, the ethernet ring that goes around the outside of, um, of the uh, uh, cyber truck allows them to do communications and, and just, get rid of so much cabling and whatnot, it's incredible. So all communications now just come off one single solitary wire, two wires maybe. And instead of having, um, let's say an inch in diameter of communication wires that would go to run your window regulator or whatever, whatever would be inside your door, a couple of wires, that's it. It's amazing how much better it could be. And the excuse used to be, oh, well, you can't do that because nobody makes 48 volts. That's a lie. It's just a plain old lie. But this is one of the problems with listening to uh, some consultants. They, they fear and, uh, and let's stay in the same place kind of uh, attitudes. That's what keeps people from moving ahead. So the next thing on my list would be absolutely, without a question of a doubt, the 48 volts any ethernet wiring. Now we move one step down, if you like, and, uh, and it's enabled by 48 volts and the ethernet ring. And that would be self, uh, sorry, um, 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 a drive by wire. Okay. I really need to have, uh, the minimum amount in order to make things happen because I got to have in m most cases, double redundancy, but in, in the case of, um, some things like the electric motors, I need triple redundancy. I, 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 if I have great big giant wire harnesses and whatnot, I can't make that work. But with the Tesla design on the Cybertruck, I mean, you might, these guy, everybody else knows what's going on. And initially when I looked at it, I thought this is probably seven or eight years ahead of everybody else. But Elon Musk threw everybody a bone and said, here, this is how you, this is how do you implement 48 volts? And when he tossed them that bone, he probably took, he probably thought he took off a year or two, but all I hear is arguing. When I listen to executives at the other auto industry saying, oh, well, wait a minute, there's probably a trap here. Right? Elon doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't have traps. It, it, things work really, really well for him. And so consequently, I believe that he was, telling the truth and making good things happen. Then we move to the rear of the cyber truck. And I will tell you, uh, there, it's not the first vehicle to have rear steering, but man, uh, the difference between driving with rear steering, especially in a parking lot on a big truck, um, the difference between rear steering and, um, and standard steering is phenomenal the turning radius is cut in half. Um, it's not like, uh, it's not like you're going to turn on your own axis, but the, but the deal with, with that wonderful, uh, rear steering on that big truck as well. It's, it's amazing. It shocked me when I tried to pull into a parking spot and wow, I'm looking at bumper. I couldn't believe how quickly it, it was, uh, it, it turned to get into that parking spot. So I, I, I think that that's, that's something that's really, truly huge. Now we've all heard about, and that puts them, that that's a four year program for me, yeah, at least four year program to make something like that happen. And then we start looking at the, the castings and things that I've talked about in the past. Cybertruck is still well ahead of everybody else. And Tesla is well ahead of everybody else into getting the, in getting into castings and whatnot. This reduces weight, reduces cost, takes a trim. It takes basically 30 to 30 to 35 percent of the floor space that I would need to build, as in the floor pan and whatnot, build um, uh, the platform. 30, that's a lot of money, and that's a lot of equipment, and that's a lot less people. So when we look at the, what they were doing, Tesla was the first to come up with, um, with 
uh, uh, castings. And, um, and everybody else, they went into their costing people and they said, oh, this is not good. Oh, it won't work. And, oh, think of the crash worthiness. Well, it's better for crash worthiness. The cost is phenomenal, phenomenally cheaper, even with the old style castings. And I'll tell you that there's a new style castings that, that Tesla came out with. So the old style castings would reduce the cost, reduce the weight and reduce the amount of floor space needed for uh, the build of the platform. That's an amazing amount of, uh, of cost reduction. But then on top of that, I don't have the people. I mean, there's a lot of folks that are picking up parts and putting them into fixtures and a lot of people that are pushing little buttons so that the welders can weld everything together. And on top of that, you get into quality issues. And when you weld a whole bunch of pieces together, you get warpage. Warpage turns into a problem. Sooner or later, you're going to have to take two pieces or two modules or two sub-assemblies and try and squeeze them together and weld them in a, in a different body buck. These things don't happen with a casting. I have one casting. I, I machine it in a couple of places and I'm done. And it's perfect. Do you know what perfect on a factory floor does for you as far as efficiency? it makes you impossible to beat impossible because it's perfect. I will never have to worry about variation. I will never have guys with two by fours and, um, and, um, peening hammers. I, I, I don't need any of that stuff. And the reason for that is because the castings are always perfect. Now they were good, good when, uh, when we were looking at the, uh, the model Y, but now Elon and his, famous um, material science guys, they've come up with a new, a new aluminum, different than what they've used in the past. This new aluminum allows them now to uh, basically shoot uh, the, uh, the aluminum faster. And the reason for that is because they've figured out something that makes it a little slippery, a little more viscous than, um, than, uh, than, than the old, uh, uh, the old aluminum. The other thing that they've got going is that they've developed a new software package that does mold flow and it helps you. It's a, I think it's an AI kind of a program. It helps you redesign the, the casting molds so that uh, it flows better and flows easier. So in the case of the front, um, front module for the, uh, Tesla, that's only a 6,000 ton press. That's, I, I don't know how to, I, when, when they told me that I, I, I was totally blown away. That's not what it, it should be an 8,000 ton press. So let me put things into perspective. Um, a thousand tons is worth about a thousand, a million bucks. So to go from a $6 million machine, sorry, an $8 million machine to a $6 million machine, that's a lot of money that you don't have to invest in. The same thing is true with the molds. The molds now seem to last longer for some reason or other. Again, going back to the material science that, again, that has to be a leadership decision to, uh, to say, hey, I want you to develop uh, a new aluminum so that we can cast it faster and better. Uh, not very many leaders uh, in the auto industry are willing to toss money at that kind of R&D, but Elon did. So that is uh, put them now another three, four, five years ahead of everybody else because everybody else is still doing it the old fashioned way. And uh, Tesla is a moving target and it's not something that you can just say, oh, because of this, that'll happen. No. Uh, once you think you're catching up, he leapfrogs again, uh, 10 years ahead of everybody else. And then everybody scrambles to try and catch up but they've already made the investments on the old design. <laughs> this guy's a genius. I mean, this is the way, uh, there's, there's a bunch of generals that I talk about. One in particular is general Sun Tzu. Uh, hmm. he was a Chinese guy who hmm. lived before Christ. So at the end of the day, this guy, he, he used to say a lot of things and, and the, and the one that's the best for this particular, uh, uh, situation is, um, is, um, fight your enemy where he's not mm -hmm. 
fight your enemy. So what does Tesla do? Well, we're not in 48 volts. Oh, we're not doing an ether ring. Oh, we're not, uh, we're not going to do steer by wire. Oh, we're not going to get into fancy castings on and on and on. Tesla, Elon Musk and Tesla are uh, very, very difficult to beat, especially if you think along old fashioned lines. <clears throat> yeah. Thank was you that, for that long enough for you? <laughs> I'm surprised you're still Sorry. awake, Herbert. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That took no, a long no, time. no. It's like complete answer. I appreciate that so much. I've got a number of questions to ask you. So yeah. one of the greatest questions you asked when you were talking to the top five executives, in my perspective, was what's the likelihood that they could partner with other OEMs to be able to help them and then also to help uh, Tesla? And I think David Lau answered by saying, well, you know, you've got software, but you can't just take the software and That's partner yeah. that because it's so intricately combined with the hardware. Having said that, you know, of course, you've got Elon saying to the OEMs, hey, you should be licensing our FSD uh, technology. You should be licensing our software. He said that two or three times to Ford's yeah. uh, um, Jim uh, Farley. What, what's your expectations? Uh, it, in terms of this, is there anything like this could happen soon, very long time from now? What's your thoughts? Well, the reason that Elon and Tesla can um, make all the software work and make it work very, very quickly uh, is because they don't have a whole lot of um, tier one and tier two suppliers. Well, they have a lot of tier two suppliers, but they don't have too many tier one suppliers. And that... Uh, increases your speed significantly. It also reduces the amount of code that you need. So uh, I think Elon, or sorry, not Elon, but uh, Jim Farley said he wants to get into making some of his own componentry because he's saddled with the software that comes from each one of these characters that makes a little black box. Um, they will send you information to tell you how to communicate with, um, with the rest of the vehicle. And uh, that's on a CAN bus, not an Ethernet system. So at the end of the day, this slows down progress considerably. If I have 150 boxes and they all are written in a code that I do not own, how do I, how do I grab a hold of um, Elon Musk's or Tesla's um, uh, software and, and pluck it into my, into my system? How, how do I do that? I, I don't make all these other little communication boxes. Okay, ECUs, and they these these ECUs are <laughs> they're 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 very in some cases tricky, in other cases they're you know they're what the they're what the tier one developed a long time ago. They don't want to change. There's no reason for them to change. They just want to keep what they've got. So I don't know. I I try not to uh, disparage a good idea because if I could do it, I would. That's for damn sure. But <laughs> I don't know how I could uh, overcome all these other issues associated with 150 little black boxes that I can't, I can communicate with them, but I have no idea how they work. That's, that's where the, the real issue lays. Uh, if, if I was a new car, like if I was going to develop a new car, yeah, all day long. I'd be in on that like white on rice. I would not at all hesitate if I was uh, designing a new car to phone up Elon or whomever, Lars, and, and say, hey, <laughs> I, I want to use all your uh, software. I, and and that, I would buy that as a complete package because that takes 10 years to develop software, 10 years after debugging and tryouts and on and on and on. 10 years. That's uh, too long for anybody to, to try and do it on their own. So, Okay. All right. So the, uh, this next question is something that you're obviously the expert in this, and I just have a rudimentary amateur look at this. So Tesla has multiple production lines, and they have one for the Model 3 and Model Y. They've now created one for the Cybertruck. It doesn't make sense to me that they're going to create a net new production line Unbox, so that makes reason why they would do it for the compact car robo taxi. Yeah. What to what extent would the Cybertruck production line 
share parts, share technology like the 48 volt, the, the first layer by wire to the unboxed model. To what extent mm. is the Cybertruck unboxed already? You know what I mean? Like why would they create yet another production line after creating a brand new one for the Cybertruck? It just gets crowded and, um, and it gets complicated. Now, one good thing about um, Tesla is they use a lot of AG, AGVs, automated guided vehicles. And these things, uh, they know where to go all by themselves. They get um, RF transmission or there's a line in the floor that gives them a radio signal, whatever. <clears throat> so what I can do is when I want, I could send uh, a product from the Model Y or the Model 3 or the Cybertruck or whatever into a different area so to have something special done to it. But for me, when you start looking at the line speed at 43 seconds, I wouldn't bugger that up uh, by, by having anything but a separate line. And I think that that's precisely what Tesla is looking at as well. And the reason for that is because when we were there, <laughs> I have no clue how many uh, cement trucks went by us. But I would say about 100, easy, when we were driving around in the, um, in the parking lots and whatnot, trying to get the cyber truck that they lent me out. And they're dumping concrete at the most ferocious rates probably since um, the Hoover Dam. That, no kidding. They, they, they're dropping a lot of concrete. That's for floors in buildings. And, um, and if they want to increase their volumes... You need buildings. And so I think that for me, I, I'm a big advocate of running same product down the same line or sorry, dissimilar product down the same line. As long as my pickup points are the same, the operators don't care as long as they're fed the right parts for the right vehicle. But there's always things that go wrong. And for Tesla at 43 seconds a cycle, everybody else is 60 plus. 60 seconds plus for a station that it would be foolish to, uh, I, I, I would, I would lose, uh, I would lose a, uh, line efficiency, um, because the cyber truck is onesie twosie. The, uh, the model three is a lower volume than the model Y the model three doesn't have too many of this. Well, it does have some things like the motors and, uh, gearboxes and things like that. And sometimes is the, battery packs. But at the end of the day, a lot of this stuff doesn't make sense. Uh, I'd have to have different batteries. It, it would just be a logistics nightmare. So I believe that uh, the single line system that they've got, perfect. I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. Okay. Now, thank you for answering that question. Another big question I think everybody's asking is uh, how advanced is the compact cars production line? We heard Elon say that, you know, they're feeling like um, he's been visiting it once a week, the production yeah. line, the, the design of that. And then was the Cybertruck already partially unboxed? And so this whole concept of the new unboxed model, are they already testing it, the Cybertruck? I don't believe that the Cybertruck could be classified as unboxed. Um, it's definitely different, a lot different than, um, than any other vehicle that's ever been put out. But... And, and I, I got to tell you, I did not see the, uh, the new small car or the robo car um, production line, zero. But when I saw all the cement trucks, I said one and one is two. I bet you that's where they're going to do it. Um, the unbox system that, uh, that were shown on the, uh, on the videos, the Investor Day videos, uh, that's very, very, very interesting. And quite frankly, it makes a whole lot of sense. I wish I would have thought something like that, <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, I'm I'm reasonably certain that um, the inbox system is going to have just about the same amount of impact as what castings did. And I know, or let me rephrase that, I don't know for sure, but um, I've seen plenty of people throwing Tesla under the bus for one reason or another. But at the end of the day, let's let's count the number of ways that that Elon um, is dumping his enemies. General Motors, <laughs> where are they? Oh, we're gonna go back to ICE vehicles, Ford. Oh, we're gonna go to hybrids. 
Volkswagen, we don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to do something. Toyota, mm -hmm. oh, we're going to go to, you know, more Priuses or, or something. I mean, I can go on all day long. They can't make up their mind. While they make goofy decisions or satisfying the uh, uh, today's investors, Tesla and the Chinese are moving ahead at a quick flip. I mean, I've lived through this already once. I, I watched, I watched the, uh, the automakers in North America. GM used to have 60% market share or thereabouts. Now it's got 15 on a good day. How did that happen? By not being able to make a good decision and not being able to make cars that the buying public was looking for. Simple. It's simple. And it's happening exactly the same way now. Oh, no, no. No one wants to have a, an electric car, a range anxiety. That's baloney. I did 8,500 miles in 11 days. There's no range anxiety. It's all, it's all crap. It's all, it's a marketing ploy. And all the rest of them, you know, oh, the maintenance costs. Are you kidding me? Versus, I'm an engine engineer. No one's going to fool me on that one. You need a lot of maintenance for an engine and a transmission. You don't need anything for an electric uh, drive. And that includes the gearbox. The gearbox will last <clears throat> for centuries. It, all these things have come up. Who made these things up? I can guarantee you who didn't make them up. And that would be an engineer. Any engineer would just laugh. At, all engineers laugh at this stuff. Oh, the other one was, oh, your tires will wear out. No, they won't. Oh, your brakes. I never use the damn brakes. I use one pedal. I take my foot off the pedal and I regenerate power and I don't need the brake pads. They don't, this is ridiculous. Oh, they only last, the, the batteries will wear out in hundred thousand miles or something. I've got, I've got lots of people who've documented over a million miles. You can't get that out of it. You can't get that out of a nice engine. I, I, I guarantee you. Yes, you can. You can, if you have a great big giant diesel and it's going into a truck, like a, a an eight wheeler, what we class, classify as an eight, a class eight truck. Yeah, you can make that happen for a million miles. How many rebuilds in between? Uh, at the end of the day, you don't see that with electric vehicles. And people come to that conclusion. I'm waiting for the, the, the generation that's coming up, the one that says they don't like the smell of gasoline. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for people who, who say, you know what's great? I don't have to go to a gas station. I just plug in when I go home and I unplug when I go to work. And I never had to go to a gas station. These things are going to somehow creep up after uh, after all of the uh, marketing guys kind of get pushed into a corner. So, so you you mentioned uh, you talked about the auto OEMs and what they were each doing. What's your thoughts on the Chinese uh, Elon? Uh, they, they're going to oh, kick ass, and that's where I was heading. Ass. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Well, the, well, the Chinese are, are they so going to be able to make ahead. it to the U.S.? Are they going to be able to make it to the U.S. and Europe? Oh, not until after the election. Hmm. Before the election, oh, no way. That's never going to happen. Hmm. Yeah, right. Go and look up gallium and find hmm. out who owns most of the gallium and find out who can't go anywhere without gallium. Okay, everybody, oh, yeah, lithium, lithium. Okay. Tell me where you're going to get your graphite from. Okay. Yeah. The only other place that I know it's got national gra natural graphite is uh, someplace in Northern Quebec. We're, we're going to be over a barrel here by the time the election comes. And I don't care who gets in. I don't want to get into the, I'm not a, I'm not a political guy, but anyways, at the end of the day, I don't care who gets in. They're going to do just the same thing as what happened when the Japanese showed up at our door. They're going to welcome home, brother. And that's the way it's going to be. And then watch the shrinking car companies. That's going to be, that's going to be really, really exciting. So mm -hmm. that's what that's I see a, right now. No, I'm glad that you said that because there are people who, who are saying that they don't see uh, the Chinese car makers being able to go global and you need to go global to have the scale to be able to compete. 
but yet uh, they're going to set up shop <clears throat> like they did already. BYD's already got shop in, in Hungary, and then they're already setting up factories here in Mexico, and then they're going to be able to just you know uh, enter that way anyways, unless there's tariffs like uh, Elon mentioned, which they likely will do. They'll put tariffs, but that may not stop them, right? It won't. We did the same thing with the Japanese. It didn't work. <clears throat> there's nothing... <laughs> Here's the deal. Uh, where does GM make most of its money? Mm. It's, uh, all China the dealers. Oh, okay. Nope. Oh, yeah. China. Well, what? They, they've they've. Oh, they're huge falling. in China. They're huge. They're falling. Okay. Yeah, they are falling, but that's where most of the profit comes from. Mm. Where does VW used to make most of their profit? Oh, China. Mm. Uh, what about Toyota? Oh, China. What happens when Chairman Xi, who is kind of like a absolute dictator? When he mm -hmm. comes along and says, oh, hmm, you won't let us in your country? Hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to just nationalize all these different countries, companies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can just live in your own market. What happens then? And you know what? Chairman Xi is no fool. That's for damn sure. He's going to wait until after the election. And then he's going to place his, the ace he's got in the hole. And, um, and everybody's going to say, hey, welcome home. And I believe, you know, everybody likes to talk about who's going to be the biggest. Well, I think BYD will be the biggest car company mm -hmm. um, in not too distant future. Tesla is going to come in either, I think, I think probably either second or third. The only other one that's got an option there would be uh, Toyota. And then... Hmm. All, I, and as far as North American um, companies are concerned, the only one I hold any hope out for that could maybe maintain most of their market share is Ford. It, uh, that's it. And, and actually when Stellantis goes and buys, uh, um, what do you call them? Renault. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> um, then that'll help them out a bit. But, but really and truly, um, the way things are right now, don't place your bets on them because that's mm -hmm. the past and it takes a long time for the past to die. But when it's dead, it's damn dead. So, you know, and Roman Empire. That, uh, <laughs> yeah. Why did you say that Toyota might actually be third still? Uh, I don't know whether Toyota or Tesla is going to be second or third. Um, and I'm, I'm looking like, I'm looking quite a ways out. I'm, I'm looking at 2030. And, uh, and the reason for that is because of one thing, again, leadership. And so mm -hmm. we look at the leadership over at Toyota and, uh, they have a uh, Sakusan who I met a long, long time ago when we were working with Toyota. And, um, he's a very clever guy. I knew him when he was younger and he is a smart very smart engineer and an astute financial businessman. Um, so I see him as being able to read the market and um, get his way in the marketplace. So that's why I, so Jim Farley and Saku Sun, that's uh, apart from, you know, other um, mm -hmm. like, like Elon Musk and whatnot, those are the guys that I see as, as uh, people who can see the future and lead their companies into prosperity. Very interesting. A few people have said the same thing, but of course we're watching Toyota still not making any moves, still saying we're going to do all the different drivetrains. Um, mm -hmm. Although in the back end, we have heard that they have been using the gigacasting and they've, they've actually yes. announced that they're also going to do the unbox model. So maybe they're doing things, even though what they're saying is different than what they'll actually come back in, but they're saying hybrids is going to be the future. And we still see up uh, just the most recent thing is we still see gas cars having a significant market share for years to come. So years to come. Yeah. I said 2030 and mm -hmm. um, in the good years, the years that you've got right now, actually, if you look back to, um, the olden days when um, when electric vehicles came out first and then gasoline uh, internal combustion came out uh, shortly after that. Oh, mm -hmm. everybody ran out and bought a carriage. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and looked yeah. for buying um, horses from Kentucky. These things, these yeah. types of things happen. And it, it's like a blip on a screen for a while and then 
they vanish. What happened to that? Where where are those whalebone corsets that we used to love so much? I mean, you know, it just does it. It just goes away. Mm -hmm. Electricity comes uh, comes to the farms, and uh, it didn't take them long to say, you know what? Um, these coal oil lamps were really nice. You know, we could cough all night uh, on the fumes from these things, but sooner or later it goes away. Now, there is one thing that <clears throat> that Toyota's got over the top of pretty much everybody else, and that's um, they they know quite a bit about hydrogen, and um, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, um, we started working on a, um, a hydrogen engine. So um, n when I found out about white hydrogen being as maybe as um, easy to get a hold of as drilling a hole in a, in, in a desert, um, I started to think, you know what, this is not a bad idea because that hydrogen is made by the planet continuously. Mm -hmm. So if we find white hydrogen, which is kind of like an unlimited supply of stuff, huh, make mine a double. Uh, I'll, I'll go and do um, internal combustion and all I do is spit water out. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. I can, I can make that happen. And that's, that's a, one of, um, Monroe does some stuff on their own and that's something that we're working on right now internally. So I, I believe that that might be a good way. I'm not a huge fan of, um, of um, uh, fuel cells um, because they've been the <laughs> they've been the power train of the future for mm -hmm. eighty years. So um, eh, maybe not, but uh, but for certain things like big trucks, yeah, that makes sense. For aircraft, ships, mm, good idea. For cars, mm, not so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Appreciate all this. So let's talk about the unbox model. Uh, what do you yeah. understand of it? And then the the question I've got is like, um, so they've announced that they're going to have two vehicles coming out of the unbox model. This is the compact car, sub twenty five thousand dollar car. I'd like mm -hmm. to ask you what price you think it will come out. And then the robo taxi, robo uh, uh, autonomous first design, which we have no idea what it's going to look like. Yeah. But is there a, there's a thing where it's going to be like Lego? putting pieces together does not not let it set up that they can then create multiple kinds of vehicles using the same unbox model. So it's not just these two vehicles. It could be like, oh, I'm going to create a limousine. I just add another middle part to it. Is that true? Or do you think that that's not, not going to likely happen? I, I think that probably what they're going to want to do is minimize the number of parts. So for me, the unboxed uh, model makes a lot of sense in some areas. In other areas, like, okay, so... A long, long time ago, when I first started the company, um, we <clears throat> we designed a, a car, um, and um, the car would have to be built um, in a, in an environment where people couldn't smash into each other. So we call that self driving now. So what we did was we developed this vehicle, and it was for the most part it had a plastic shell, and we called it. The leisure suit, because <laughs> that's what it was down, it melted down leisure suits from <laughs> the 70s. And, um, and we, what we were looking at was um, a car that had very, very few pieces, almost none. And in fact, we had um, a cast aluminum body. Now, this was a small car because we were going to try and sell it. We said that it's going to sell for but between five and $7,000. Now that's a long, long time ago. It was in the um, early '90s, something like that. Um, but you know what? Uh, we're pretty good at guessing how much things cost, and um, and I figured we could make that happen. So anyway, um, if we see the unboxed system out there, I think that there's going to be some things that they showed. Yes, they uh, they make a lot of sense, and I'd do that tomorrow if I if I was um, uh, in in the business or designing a new vehicle. However, some of the other stuff, I, we're into, a, we're going to be into a situation where the, um, we're going to be in a situation soon that is going to allow us to drive without the potential of getting into an accident. Anybody that's looked on the, uh, on uh, X, Twitter, whatever you want mm -hmm. to call it, has seen these videos of, and, 
and nobody gets killed. Nobody gets hurt. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody escapes because somebody had a Tesla. Well, um, I believe that that's around the corner. And if that's the case, if I'm not going to see accidents, okay, so do I need seatbelts? Do I need mm -hmm. airbags? Do I need to have a huge bumper? Do I need to have a lot of the stuff that we classify as just standard operating procedure? Now, what happens when I, I can't smash into something else? What do I need to, uh, I need, I need something to shelter the people inside. That's all. Keep them out of the rain and the snow and whatnot. As you move toward that, then it makes a whole lot more sense to have something that would be like a body shot out of one part. And by the way, we had the leisure suit car, but Chrysler, uh, Francois Castaing, he developed something he called the pop bottle car, same junk. And, um, and he went crazy. Uh, we were at a, we were at a, some sort of a charity thing and I was standing by the shrimp hole waiting to escape. And, and he came up and started rattling at me. Who told you about our car? Mm -hmm. Nobody told me about his car, but I'm pretty sure that everybody else was thinking the same thing. How do we get to a car that everybody can afford mm -hmm. at a, you know, a price point that everybody can afford? And, and how do we make it so that, um, it could be super inexpensive. And that's where I'm starting to think maybe there's going to be some very revolutionary bits and pieces that are going to be manufactured by Tesla and everybody's going to go, Oh, I didn't think of that. And that's kind of like that surprise stuff. In fact, I don't know if you're aware of it, but we have sitting on our floor for the last 15 years. That's way before Tesla. We have, we have a uh, three castings that make up the whole bottom end of a car. Mm -hmm. I showed that to everybody, everybody that would listen. Do you think anybody went for it? Not a chance. Sandy, you really don't understand that mentality of these things can't happen gets in the way of any kind of creativity. So that's where you have to have really good leadership. Somebody that can, that can see the future and then enable it to happen. So that's what yeah. I think is going to happen with unboxed. That's yeah. how you get it to be cheaper or lower price. But what about right. this idea that it's Lego pieces so you can then create multiple, not just these two vehicles? Is that a possibility or do you think that's just they're going to create these two You mean snap together it? vehicles? Well, yeah. snap yeah. fits are wonderful. Um, we, uh, we recommend them over any other, something else that uh, we call them slave fasteners. So you, they don't really do anything. They just hold two things that are needed mm -hmm. together. So screws, rivets, on and on and on, glue. I don't know exactly how they're going to do that. Um, snapping things together is good, but how do I keep them together forever? That's hard, especially if they got paint on them. And that's what, excuse me. <clears throat> um, especially if they got paint on them. And that's why what I look at, um, what I look at is uh, this works remarkably well with some plastics like carbon fiber, but carbon mm -hmm. fiber won't get you to a cheap car. It'll give you a crash worthiness and it gives you um, a staying power. I mean, you don't paint carbon fiber either. If you don't want to, you just throw clear, clo clear coat over the top of it to protect it from UV and then boom, it, it's done. So I, I think that there's going to be, Elon shows, you know, if you play poker, sometimes you get two cards up yeah, mm -hmm. and, um, and then three cards are in your hand, three cards down. Mm -hmm. And you look at your three cards and you look at the two cards that are up there and then you bet accordingly. Well, Elon likes to do that too. He got two cards up. Maybe he's got an ace and a four. What is in the rest of those? What's the other three? Is he got two more aces and another four? At the end of the day, nobody knows what he's got until he flips his hand over and then everybody goes, well, that can't happen. And then you get all these clowns. Uh, I don't think they got engineering degrees, or at least they never, if they did, then they immediately transferred to an MBA or something. But I can guarantee, or maybe acting. I've seen some of these guys are really good um, in front of the camera. But anyways, you look at these cards and you go, this is genius. Not, you can't make that happen. Because... 
betting against Elon, you'll always lose. Always. I don't oh, bet okay. against him. That's for sure. I love it. Love it. Um, so let me ask you about robo taxi, right? So in order to create a, you ha you actually covered it a little bit earlier today. That so if you're going to create a autonomous driving first vehicle, is it? Uh, some of the thinking was that you needed to have <clears throat> the steer by wire. You needed to have the 48 volt. You now need to have this a brake by wire. And once you do that, you can now have the unbox model things pop together. Then you can create the robo taxi because now it can just drive itself without a steering wheel, and you right. know that it can it control itself not much clear. So that's is that the path that they were taking? Like they had to like introduce these new technologies one at a time, and then finally it's like everything needed for a autonomous first vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the autonomous vehicle, I I've not seen pictures. I I've read stuff, but it's yeah. it wasn't written by Elon Musk. So. Um, I take everything with a grain of salt. However, if I was going to pick, um, if I was going to look at the uh, the problems that they have with traffic in New York, if I had robo taxis that all communicated with each other, even if mm -hmm. I had to start off with someone would would be in the in the car uh, just in case, right? Uh, no steering wheel or anything else like that, but just in case. Um, and I I looked at the situation. I mean. Anybody who's been in New York City knows it's a nightmare to get from point A to point B. Most of the times, it, it, you could walk faster. And in some cases, you know, I've seriously thought about stealing one of those bicycles. And mm -hmm. but, but at the end of the day, if I've got a robo-taxi system that communicates with each other, think about the possibilities on that one. I'd know where every crash was. I'd know where every police investigation was. I'd know where traffic is thick where whatever all the, all the situations and then with ai i could i could find a way around it to i could get to my point uh my destiny in a really short period of time or destination i should say in a really short period of time so i think mm -hmm. it's a great idea i looked at canoe i thought that was that was brilliant but um again investors are um sometimes they're fickle and what worked for them, you know, one day doesn't work the next day. And they just pick up their money and run home. Yeah. So I'm not 100% sure um, what all is going to happen, but I know one thing for sure. Uh, no matter what, um, if Elon says he's going to do it, it'll, do, it'll be done. And when it's done, everybody's going to be rubbing their chin or saying it can't work or just the usual stuff when... Elon Musk does something. Uh, I have to ask you about the bots uh, and ask you clearly what happened. Like you actually mentioned that you had seen a video and then yeah. you were talking about incredible what the bots can do. So uh, how would robots, humanoid bots specifically impact an auto production line or auto assembly and factory? Okay. And then, so, and then, and let's go into specifically what exactly did yeah. you see and what, what do you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, I was at the, um, luster pearl and, um, yeah. there were people coming up. Can you take a picture? Can you sign this baseball hat or something? And, uh, and I was doing all these things and someone came up. I cannot tell you whether it was a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. I don't remember anything. They just shoved this phone in front of my face and uh, turned this thing on and all i could do was look at this robot now uh, my guys told me that uh, you got sucked in it's it's an ai generated blah blah whatever i don't know all i can tell you was what i saw was dramatic enough <laughs> that i could see almost nobody being needed inside of a factory what i mm -hmm. saw was uh, science fiction i mean it only it's not fiction. If this was the real deal, if what I saw was real, and and by the way, I asked that person because I was still staring at the phone, can you send that to me? And I gave him a card and mm -hmm. I got nothing back, zero. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a very brief uh, situation. But what I saw was the, uh, the robot picked up one part, picked up a second part, put it into kind of like a fixture, picked up a bolt and, and washer in one hand and then a, a nut and washer in the other hand, uh, fastened it by hand and then, uh, and then used two, two rundown tools to, to put it together. And he did it or it did it, um, really quickly. 
really quickly. And it had what I suspect uh, was um, was uh, like silicon fingers. So, so the dexterity of this thing was just phenomenal. I and everybody says, well, what they did was they just you know took a human being and then they just colored over the stuff and then, well, maybe. But what I've seen of Elon's robots, um, he's focused on the three Ds: dirty, dangerous, and drudgery. And that's what I focused on. I saw, I worked on the first robots, Unimate robots um, in 19, would that be 1965 or 66, something like that. Um, I was in the trade. My dad ran a factory that was putting out automation and Unimate was the first robot ever. And I look at that crude mess of, it was a nightmare to, to try and make work and all the progress that we've seen so far. And then I see Elon's robots and he's focused on still the same things. The original reason for a robot was dirty, dangerous, and drudgery. How do we take human beings out of a nasty environment and put in a machine? And if it gets hit or whacked or crushed or whatever, mm -hmm. I don't care, I'll get another. But I don't wanna, have is, watch a human being mm, basically fall apart right before my eyes or worse mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of nasty things that happen in factories and I, I will never, I, I look at myself as the steward for the working man and I never want to see another industrial accident as long as I live. Mm -hmm. Having a robot do this kind of stuff is, is brilliant. And everything I've seen from, Elon's robots tell me that he can do quite a bit of stuff because there's a lot of drudgery jobs. There's a lot of dangerous jobs. And, and at the end of the day, when you, when you look at, um, especially when you start getting into foundries and whatnot, it's damn dirty. So uh, I, I think that that's the real first purpose for the robots. The second one is, um, people are expensive and um and after the uaw um i don't know people call it a revolution i think uh i think it's uh, an execution but anyways uh, after after you see the prices and whatnot, on how people are going to have to work or how much it's going to cost for people to work in a factory i see that as being uh technologies that are going to be scooted along real quickly because in the past, labor was so insignificant, it didn't, it didn't make much difference. Now, when you basically double up, that's a big difference. And, um, and if I can put a robot in to do what a man can do, and it'll give me the same, same um, quality levels and whatnot, and I don't, I mean, he can work in the dark. I don't need to turn on the lights. And mm -hmm. one thing that's really impressive is these robots can see out of the back of their head. And that's where lots and lots of people get hurt in the factory. They can't see what's going on in mm -hmm. back of them. They step back and the next thing you know, they, mm -hmm. I don't, like I said, I've seen plenty. And um, after you've seen one person run over, that's more than enough. So uh, I, 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 I yeah. see these things as a, a big benefit for at least dirty, dangerous, and drudgery. Okay, so so you said that you saw this video, and did you even know if it was a Tesla bot or it could have been just any bot, or was it? It looked Tesla? similar to a Tesla bot, except that it had a communication cable or a power cable coming out of the top of its head. That's the only okay. thing that I can tell you. I have no idea who the person. Okay. Like I said, I can't even remember if it was a man or a woman. All right. I, I didn't pay attention to anything except that, that screen. And I couldn't stop looking at it because yeah, yeah. I've been doing this for, well, I'm yeah. 75 now and I started when I was 16. So you can do the math. Yeah. It's a long okay. time. Okay. So that, that clarified that a little bit. And then uh, let's say that there's a factory <clears throat> gig in Mexico and Tom Drew said that there's going to be 10,000 employees there. And he said, imagine if there's 5,000 uh, optimists there as well. In your guess of your understanding of how factories work and auto production lines, what percentage of humans could be replaced and like how many are we thinking per factory? I mean, I don't know how you just maybe guess on that. Wait a minute. You said 
I just added that up. You got 40,000 people working at a no, factory. No. He's had 10,000 employees. And then he said, imagine if there's 5,000 of them are optimists. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that, that does not surprise me. And, uh, um, that would be, uh, the wave of the future. I think, um, I think that's, that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good estimate because in that, um, in that 10,000, in the big number, um, you've got supervisors, you've got the front office, you got, uh, loading and unloading trucks, like logistics and stuff like that. 5,000, uh, 5,000 robots in the areas that would, uh, be in the three D's. That would be that would be a great start. That would be a good start. Yeah. yeah. So I want to ask you about Monroe and Associates, your company. Uh, you did you actually get a hold of a semi? Did you get hold of a Cybertruck? And then tell me more about your company, what you guys do. Okay, so uh, we did not get a semi. <clears throat> um, we are getting Cybertrucks. Um, yeah. We're getting two of them. Um, told that they're going to be built sometime around the fifteenth or started mm -hmm. around the fifteenth. Hopefully we'll get them before the end of the month. And then we're nice. one will be, uh, well, they both come in under Monroe and associates, but one will eventually be my truck. Um, and, uh, the other one will, uh, be sacrificed in the name of science. <laughs> so, um, so that's, that's kind of how it works. Um, nice. Monroe and associates. Please do the steel ball. Please do the steel ball and the, uh, the <laughs> uh Sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, I'll take a, take a shot at that. Actually, one of the things that I want to try and do is show you how you can change the color of the car mm -hmm. with a, um, a, a acetylene torch. torch, a flame saw. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, yeah. But uh, anyways, Monroe and Associates works on quite a bit of different things. Um, probably the best thing we ever worked on was, uh, was an intravenous pump that we took from a company that was basically, they, they were dead, but they refused to lay down and we redesigned their product and whatnot. And it went from mediocre, but cheap, mm -hmm. heavy, the nurses hated it, um, and turned it into, um, the intravenous pump that pretty much everybody on the planet wanted to buy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the big thing for me was that it was neonatal. So, that was a big deal. Um, another big thing that nobody knows about is that we, we helped run the, um, the 787 program. Alan Lolly brought us in when there was only five people on that program. And, um, and I was one of them and Dan McCarthy, one of my associates, um, he was one of the others and then Alan Mullally and then two guys that, um, that, uh, vanished or something. I don't know. We didn't get along with Alan, but we were there right through the whole works. We worked on everything except the wings. And the only thing that fa actually, one of the good things is 2,300 hours to, uh, build the interior on a, a triple seven. And we got it down to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 2000. So did, did I say 23,000 hours on the triple seven? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, basically 2,200 hours. So tenfold wow. on the, uh, on the 787. So we were, we were very beneficial in cost and weight reduction and everything worked. And like I say on that, that plane should have come in a year early if, um, the wing guys hadn't, if they don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's a tip. If you, yeah. uh, if you're going to, um, <laughs> build an airplane out of carbon fiber, don't use yeah. rivets. Okay. That's, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Can, that's all I can tell you. But, Your but we've worked on yeah. ton. We, well, uh, I, like I, most people know that we take apart cars, we, mm -hmm. but really what they don't know is we design cars. We design mm -hmm. them. We do the, um, all the, um, equipment and whatnot. We buy that for the customer. We do the layouts, um, process sheets, everything. And, um, and for, for auto automotive vehicles, but we've also worked on things as diverse as the Javelin, uh, Javelin yeah, missile, yeah. um, awesome. all kinds of, I mean, when, when people have a real problem, 
they they try all the usual things and then somebody will say hey uh, what about monroe and uh, mm -hmm. we're very good at coming up with inventions and we don't keep anything any invention that we came up with belongs to the customer and nice. that's something you don't see very often so wow. so those are those are kind of uh, like the high points yeah. Okay, yeah and Sandy, yeah because you i know you've got nothing but uh financial people out there mm -hmm. uh we also do due diligence forward-looking due diligence i don't care about what you see in the rearview mirror i'm looking at what your future might hold so if anybody's listened all the way to the end <laughs> it's the last message and we're open yeah, for business it. yeah no no yeah. for sure i mean uh so that's uh, yeah. thank you so much i mean you've blown our minds here today as always uh, you're you're sharp and you've got so much knowledge and experience you just brought and I did not know a lot of things you just said there it's Monroe and so it's just beyond cars uh, yeah. so you can follow um Sandy on X at Teardown Titan love the nickname his YouTube channel is yeah. called Monroe Live um, and then you can check out their website at leandesign.com thank you for this opportunity Sandy this was a uh, uh, wonderful appreciate your time thank you well, very thank much. you Herbert this was okay. I, I had a good time thank you thank you appreciate that Okay. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.